will allow increased access to responsible domestic oil production. And for these reasons, I support the bill and I yield back. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And at this time, I would like to recognize the majority whip, uh, or the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy, for two minutes. Gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank um, freshman Cory Gardner for bringing this legislation to the floor. Mr. Speaker, I want to, for one moment, imagine. I want to imagine a country of America that doesn't have 40 months of 8% unemployment. I want to imagine America with 3% unemployment. Could you imagine a country that had a trade deficit that was shrunk? Could you imagine a government that, instead of saying they want to raise taxes, they actually cut them? Imagine that in a housing crisis, that you're not sitting with foreclosures, but you actually need more houses to be built. That people are flying into the country because the jobs are there and the place to be. I want to imagine when you go down to even work at McDonald's, you're making $15 an hour. A lot of people in this country turn on the news, they think that's far-fetched. They think that's impossible to dream or even to imagine. But you know what? That's taken place in parts of this country. That's exactly what's happening in North Dakota. And why is it happening in North Dakota? Because they created a state energy policy that unshackled. There is a team here, Mr. Speaker, that is called the HEAT team, the House Energy Action Team. And we went across the country from all walks of life, from California to driving an electric car in Colorado to going into the fields of North Dakota where I went. And you know what? I drove past the windmills. I looked at the new technology from able to extracting in a much more pinpointed method and environmentally friendly that we can get that resources. And what has it done? It has transformed the state from job creation, but more importantly, it has transformed our nation. Because yes, we are importing less today since 1994, but that's only on private lands, not on public lands. Additional 30 seconds. So today on this floor, we are debating something that can change America. So no longer will you sit back home and think one day I could only imagine unemployment low, revenues are high, and everybody that wants a job can have one. Well, this bill today is about jobs. It's about jobs that not only create it in America, but it changes our foreign policy. It creates a new America where we invest today, and it makes us energy independent. Mr. Speaker, I ask all to vote aye, and I thank the gentleman for bringing it to the floor, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois. Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, I reserve. Gentleman, reserve. gentleman continues to reserve his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I'd like to rec yield uh, one minute to the majority leader, uh, Mr. Cantor. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank, thank the gentleman. Uh, I rise in support of this legislation before us that will boost domestic energy production, spur job creation, and grow the economy. The Domestic Energy and Jobs Act opens up more of our domestic energy resources, brings greater certainty to leasing on public lands, and does take steps to cut red tape that is increasing the cost of fuel and blocking energy development. Increasing energy production on our nation's public lands and waters can create millions of jobs, boost the economy, lower energy costs, and make America more secure. It wasn't too long ago that an energy secure America seemed like an unreachable goal. Today, energy security is on the horizon because of innovations that have helped cause our domestic energy supply uh, and create have helped increase our supply and created thousands of good paying jobs along the way. I saw these innovative technologies firsthand when I was out on a deep sea rig off the coast of Louisiana a few weeks ago. 
With this legislation, we give our nation's energy producers the certainty they need to invest in the innovations that are essential to American-made energy and American-made jobs. The oil and gas industry is the lifeblood of so many communities across our nation. But this President's policies have stifled the development of many of our nation's energy resources. Red tape and restrictions coming from the Obama administration are keeping America's abundant energy resources under lock and key, away from our job-creating private sector. As a result of some of these policies, small businesses are feeling the squeeze of high energy costs. Families planning their summer vacations are facing historically high gas prices, and new jobs are being sidelined. People are wondering, when will things get better? They're looking for leadership out of Washington, and frankly, this administration has not delivered. Since the President took office, production on public lands has decreased. While I welcome the administration's announcement that it is moving forward with a long-delayed lease sale in the central Gulf of Mexico, it is simply unacceptable that this is the first lease sale the administration has held in the central Gulf since 2010. Our nation's energy producers have been ready and waiting to put their capital on the line to develop our nation's resources. Delaying decisions critical to energy development creates uncertainty and slows job creation. In fact, the Obama administration has canceled more lease sales than it has actually held. And I think the big question is, why aren't we doing more? Why aren't we developing more of our nation's outer continental shelf, such as that off the coast of Virginia, where there is broad bipartisan consensus in my state supporting such development? After years of watching the President fail to embrace a pro-growth energy policy, the American people do deserve more. The future of our country depends on a true all-of-the-above energy strategy that promotes domestic energy production, job creation, and economic growth. By adding certainty to the regulatory process, we can promote domestic energy development in an environmentally sensitive way. We can promote economic growth and get Americans back to work. These seven bills, part of the HEAT team package, will help bring down high energy costs that are hurting families, crippling small businesses, and spurring, and we can then spur the creation of thousands of jobs. I want to salute and thank the House Energy Action Team, the bill's chief sponsor, Congressman Cory Gardner, Congressman Ed Whitfield, Congressman Scott Tipton, Mike Kaufman, Congressman Doug Lamborn, and Bill Johnson for putting forward these measures that will harness our domestic energy resources. Finally, I'd like to thank our whip for his leadership, Kevin McCarthy, uh, in bringing all of this together, as well as Chairman Fred Upton and Chairman Doc Hastings for their leadership on these measures that are essential to our nation's competitiveness and job creation. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Illinois. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to yield four minutes to uh, the one of the most uh, remarkable leaders that this Congress has ever seen, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized for four minutes. I thank my friend, and I would have come up here just for that introduction. I <laughs> thank him so much. I am pleased to follow my friend, uh, the distinguished majority leader, uh, Mr. Cantor. I'm going to have some remarks, but before I get to those remarks, I want to uh, give you some statistics that I know you'll find very interesting, and I want you to take them to heart. The Energy Information Administration reports that oil production from federal lands and waters was higher was higher the first three years of the Obama administration than the last three years of President Bush's administration. In, additional, in addition, oil imports, imports are at the lowest they've been since 1997. In 2011, U.S. crude oil production reached its highest level in eight years, increasing by an estimated 110,000 barrels per day over 2010 levels to 5.59 million barrels per day. We now produce more than 50% of the crude oil we use domestically. The U.S., uh, by the way, has 1,971 rigs in operation. The rest of the world has 1,471. 
America has 1,971 rigs in operation. The rest of the world, 1,471. U.S. natural gas production is record-breaking. In 2011, 28 and a half million cubic feet. In 1973, which was the previous record, it was 24 million cubic feet. But hear this, in 2005, during the Bush administration, it was 5 million less. New net imports as a share of total consumption has declined from 2005, where it was 60% in the Bush administration, to 2011, where it's 47%. The administration has announced the 2012-2017 five-year leasing plan, which will open up more than 75% of our potential offshore oil and gas resources. U.S. production from federal lands onshore is similar to and at a point has surpassed the Bush administration. In 2005, it was 649 million barrels. In 2010, 739 million barrels, otherwise known as almost 100 million more barrels. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we understand that we need to produce and use energy in America. Mr. Speaker, we should be working, however, together to find real solutions to meet our pressing challenges. We ought to pass a long-term highway bill to create thousands of construction jobs. We ought to address the looming deadline when student loan interest rates are set to go up on July 1st. We ought to get to work on taxes so we can keep low rates in place for middle class families. And we ought to get serious about comprehensive deficit reduction before we find ourselves on the edge of a fiscal cliff this year. Instead, Mr. Speaker, once again, we have a solution looking for a problem. Uh, our Republican friends have called up two bills on the floor this week that make this very clear. While gas prices have thankfully retreated, the first bill would enact an extreme drill-only energy strategy that won't lower gasoline prices. That bill is notable for what it doesn't do, invest in diverse energy sources that create jobs, reduce our oil dependence, and enhance energy security, nor does it make our nation a global leader in energy technology. The second bill that we considered uh, yesterday uh, would impose a radical policy on our border areas that would undermine security coordination and bring polluting industries to some of our most pristine parks and historic sites. I ask the gentleman for one additional minute. Mr. I hear one additional minute. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for an additional minute. I thank the uh, speaker and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, as I was saying, bring polluting industries to some of our most pristine parks and historic sites, even though even though our border enforcement officials have said such legislation is unnecessary. That's what we worked on yesterday. Not jobs, not student loans, not transportation, uh, but a uh, piece of legislation that they said wasn't necessary. These are not what Congress ought to be focusing on this week or next week. Let's turn our attention to our most pressing issues, student loans, construction jobs, keeping middle tax middle class taxes low and reducing deficits instead of wasting the American people's time on partisan bills that won't solve any of our real problems. Mr. Speaker, I'm hopeful that either in the next 24 hours or in the next nine days we will in fact pass a jobs bill that will create jobs and everybody knows that. That's the highway bill. The Senate's passed a highway bill in a bipartisan fashion with half of the Republicans in the United States Senate voting for it and with a very conservative uh, Republican ranking member, Jim Imhoff, and a very liberal uh, chairman, 20 seconds. Uh, this is 20 20 seconds. 30 seconds. The gentleman's got an additional 30 seconds. And a very liberal chairwoman, Barbara Boxer, came together and had the ability to compromise and come to agreement. I tell my friends on the Republican side, that's what the American people want us to do. And if we do that, it will raise the confidence of our people, of our business community, of our country. And that will be the best thing we can do for our country. Come together in a bipartisan fashion, as the United States Senate did, 
and act. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to yield a minute and a half to the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. The gentlelady from Alabama is recognized for 90 seconds. Thank you, and thanks to the gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act. Oil accounts for 37 percent of U.S. energy demand, with 71 percent directed to fuels that are used in transportation. Our energy policy is vitally important to our national and economic security. It's especially important to the mother who drives her children to school, as it is the business owner who operates a fleet of delivery vehicles. When the price of gasoline increases, Americans hurt. Last year, the price of gasoline increased 81 cents per gallon. That is why I do support an all-of-the-above approach to energy. This includes opening up new areas for American energy exploration, transitioning to renewable and alternative energy, and using more clean and reliable nuclear. The President, in his last State of the Union, stated the same belief, but this administration has done nothing to back up that statement. The executive branch is using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for political purposes, imposing overburdensome regulations on refineries and placing obstacles to increasing permitting and leasing on federal lands for gas and oil production. During this administration, we have seen a drastic decrease of oil production on federally owned lands at a time with high gas prices. From 2010 to 2011, there has been a 14 percent decrease. The Domestic Energy and Jobs Act will, will enable job creators in the energy industry and increase domestic energy production here at home. The legislation that is before us today will turn the tide on this administration's actions or lack thereof and allow our nation to move forward to our nation's energy production, thereby increasing jobs and bringing us closer to energy independence. I urge all of my colleagues to vote in favor of this bill. Gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, how much time remains on this Gentleman side? from Illinois has three minutes remaining. Three minutes. Gentleman from Colorado has 11 and one-half minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I hear two minutes from the gentleman from Tennessee. Gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Rush. I appreciate the time. And I rise in opposition to H.R. 4480. This is a bill that's totally a, a, a giveaway to big oil. The fact is, if we want to be energy independent, we can't drill our way to energy independence. We can get there by having alternative green energies that will create jobs and make us independent. We can have wind and solar, and we can have higher fuel standards for automobiles. And that's the best thing we can do is reduce the demand for, for oil by having higher fuel standards, which we don't have in this bill. The questions about the price of oil and making ourselves energy independent, it's not going to happen. You know, the other side, my colleagues on the other side, at least some of them, for quite a while, about two, three months ago, blamed the rising price of gasoline prices on President Obama. President Obama, the rising price of gasoline has come down in considerably since that time. And has one person had the veracity, the, 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 the bipartisanship to say, Mr. President, thank you for bringing the price of oil down? No, they haven't, because the President didn't bring the price of oil down, just like he didn't take the price of oil up. It's political rhetoric to say he caused the prices to go up, and it'd be wrong to say he brought them down. There are world markets, a demand in China, a demand in India, a demand even in Bangkok. And, and those demands have put the price of oil up. The situation in Iran with Israel have jeopardized and created concerns about the future of oil shipment through the, the, the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, because of that, prices went up. That situation's been rectified. This bill is only a giveaway to big oil. It threatens people's First Amendment rights because it says they have to put up a $5,000 bond simply to protest. It threatens jobs in many industries, the outdoors industry. It threatens public health and people's opportunities to be free from air pollution. It threatens hunting, fishing, and recreation and grazing because it, it violates the multiple use doctrines established by the federal land policy and management. This is not a good bill for America, and to be energy independent, we need to find green energy and green jobs. I yield back the balance. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Speaker, I yield 90 seconds to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Conway. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for 90 seconds. Actually, Madam Speaker, to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in support, strong support for the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act of 2012 because I personally know the, the importance of the oil and gas industry to the future of America. 
I'm fortunate to call West Texas home. Growing up in the Permian Basin has given me a better perspective on what it means to produce the raw resources that our nation needs to power its, uh, its uh, industry. It's a perspective that's come from working on a drilling rig uh, in Fort Stockton, Texas, uh, drilling uh, miles and miles below the surface of the earth. It's this pursuit of oil and gas miles below our feet that's reinvigorating the pockets of the American economy from Texas to Pennsylvania to North Dakota. The work is hard, but the rewards can be great. Not just for the producers, but also for the roughnecks and the thousands of small and large firms that support the drilling activity and the communities that they host, that host them. Our nation relies and prospers, Mr. Speaker, on affordable, abundant energy like oil and gas. This bill will ensure that not only do we have affordable energy, but that Americans are put back to work producing it. The oil and gas industry on private lands is, is uh, thriving in spite of this administration's attempt to slowly suffocate it. Today's legislation would reverse the glacial pace of permitting and pointless regulations designed solely to, to slow down production on federal lands. Mr. Chairman, this bill will do the things that the President's failed stimulus act has, has failed to do. It will drive investment into American businesses and will put Americans back to work, just like the oil and gas industry has been doing in District 11 for over 80 years. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, uh, I reserve, I intend to close. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'd like to yield a minute and a half to another gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one and one-half minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise today in support of the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act of 2012. Every developed economy in the world looks to their own resources as assets to fuel their economic growth. Yet, many folks in Washington view our domestic energy resources as a liability. Unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats continue to dream up ways to lock up, restrict, tax, or otherwise regulate these assets away from benefiting the American people. This is an issue of critical importance for our economic security, our national security, our energy security, and most importantly, for the opportunities that we hope to leave for future generations. We desperately need the stability that comes from unlocking access and tapping into our American energy resources. The Domestic Energy and Jobs Act does just that by allowing us to pursue an all-the-above energy plan that removes unwarranted government roadblocks to domestic energy production and supply. This bill will also help reduce our federal deficits and our trade deficits. In the case of the former, it helps reduce our federal deficit in multiple ways. One, by growing the American economy and American jobs. Two, by increasing royalties and lease payments to the federal treasury. And three, by reducing the cost of energy for the American economy. In the case of the latter, increased production of American energy will, re will result in lower oil imports from, fewer, from foreign sources and reduced payments for those imports, thereby keeping more American money at home to rebuild our economy. I urge my colleagues to support the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act, which would create jobs, grow our economy, reduce our dependence on unstable Middle Eastern oil, improve our national security, and restore the American dream for future generations. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois. I continue to reserve. Gentleman to reserve. Gentleman from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this point, I would like to yield one minute to the gentleman from Louisiana, my freshman colleague, Mr. Landry. Gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here are some facts. An estimated 13 million Americans are out of work. The state of Colorado's unemployment rate is 8.1 percent, which correlates with the national unemployment rate. Today, the state of Colorado's estimated reserves are a billion barrels of oil. In 1995, the state of North Dakota's estimated reserves were 151 million barrels. Today, those reserves have been increased to 4.2 billion barrels of oil, but yet, to, and so, but yet today, the state of North Dakota's unemployment rate is 3%. What do those facts tell us? Those facts tell us that drilling equals jobs, Mr. Speaker, and it's very simple. In North Dakota, they are drilling on private lands. They are driving unemployment rates down. Please, if the president wants a jobs plan, it is here. And I urge all members to vote for this bill. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I the balance. Does the gentleman from Illinois continue to reserve? reserve. Gentlemen reserves. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support for H.R. 
4480, a bill that promises to open up more public land to energy development and to streamline burdensome rules and heavy-handed regulations that now thwart new domestic energy development in the United States. The President and the uh, Democratic-led uh, Senate continue to obstruct the utilization of America's enormous natural resources. What are they? they are, and these resources are a God-given asset that has elevated the well-being and prosperity of our people ever since the time of our nation's founding. Now, when we need that wealth and the, uh, the wealth of those resources more than ever, we suffer the obstructionism of our own government. The president has prevented the construction of the Key Lime pipeline. The president has shut down oil and gas uh, production offshore. And most recently, this administration, and perhaps most heinously, this administration has moved with plans to add onerous uh, rules and regulations on a new emerging technology. The efforts of this administration are mind-boggling because there is no evidence that this technology has done any harm to our people, and there is ample evidence that this technology would produce significant economic growth, thus jobs. And I am referring to, of course, fracking, which is clearly been targeted by the president's, uh, uh, let's say, by the president and by his environmental Gestapo friends. Uh, while we are talking today and while we're trying to determine whether or not we're going to be using more resources, gasoline prices are changing the lifestyle of the American people. We're talking about people who are paying $3.50 a gallon, and in my state, $4 a gallon. Why are we allowing our people, 13 million people of, of which are currently out of work and suffering under these conditions, why are we adding such cost uh, for them to bear? Uh, what we need, Mr. Pres uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Speaker, is we need to make sure that we move forward, as this bill will do, to yeah, make sure to ensure that we are we are fulfilling our commitment to the American people to do everything we can to make sure that they will live in prosperity and freedom and hope for a better life for their children. This has always been tied to the utilization of natural resources, and this bill will ensure that our people will benefit from those gifts that God gave us underneath our ground and public lands. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, yields back. The gentleman from Illinois continues to reserve. Yes, we do. He reserves. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this point, we'd like to yield one minute to another freshman, uh, Mr. Gozer from Arizona. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, outside these walls, people across our country are suffering. Electric bills and gasoline prices are increasing as we enter the heat of the summer. Over 13 million Americans are still without work. Our constituents are counting us on us to take action. The Republican-led House has been leading the way with solutions to our country's energy problems. The bill before us today, the Domestic Energy and Job Act, is just another part of that agenda. It will remove government roadblocks and bureaucratic red tape that hinder onshore oil, natural gas, and renewable energy production, and will facilitate job creation. This act truly embraces all of the above approach that our country so desperately needs. A country is only as strong as its people. Henry Ford II once said, what's right about America is that although we have a mess of problems, we have great capacity, intellect, and resources to do something about them. Let's use that capacity to address our country's energy crisis and put people back to work. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois. Uh, Mr. Speaker, continue to reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I am prepared to, to close if I have no further speakers on my side. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I. Uh, Gentleman from Illinois. You myself as much time as I make for spoon. Gentleman has one minute to consume. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is widespread opposition to the Republican above all above all bill. The Obama administration opposes the Republican bill. A statement of administration policy says the administration strongly opposes 
4480, which will undermine the nation's energy security, roll back policies that support the continuing growth of safe and responsible energy production in the United States, discourage environmental analysis and civic engagement in federal decision making, and impede progress on important Clean Air Act rules to protect the health of American families. If the, if the president were presented with H.R. 4480, his senior advisors would, would recommend that he veto the bill. Numerous public health organizations oppose this bill, including the Academy of, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and various others. Mr. Speaker, uh, this bill is nonsensical. There's another list, another bill and a long list of big oil giveaways pushed by the most anti-environmental house in the history of our nation. I yield back to the balance. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, just inquire how much time I have remaining. The gentleman from Colorado has four minutes remaining. I thank the speaker and thank you for your patience during this debate. 64,805 jobs, 64,805 jobs, $4.3 billion in wages, $14.9 billion in annual economic impact. That's the number of jobs, the amount of wages, the number of economic impact that we would have seen today, but if not for the backlog of BLM projects over the past three years. 65,000 jobs. There are 22 proposed projects in the western United States that would create nearly 121,000 jobs. Over the past few years, we have seen gas prices increase dramatically. $3.50, $3.60, $3.70. We've heard debate on the House floor tonight that they're going down. Well, you know what? Even a flood can be lower by a foot the next day, but it's still a flood. Our constituents who are paying $60, $70 to fill up with a tank of gas to drive their families to school, trying to put food on the table, to get to work, cannot afford high energy prices year after year. This bill, this package of bill presents us with an opportunity to create jobs, to build on American energy independence, to make sure that we are doing the one thing that we set out to do, and that is to improve the economic chances of this country, our competitiveness, and the lives of our constituents. But they can't do it with gas prices exceeding $3, $4, what's next? Because here we are again. The policies presented in this bill will allow us to cut through red tape, to increase exploration on our great lands in the western United States across this country in an environmentally responsible fashion. It will allow us to make sure that when we access the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because of a supply problem that we're also addressing a long-term supply fix instead of just quick fix politics. We have an opportunity to make sure that when it comes to the regulations that are driving up the price of gasoline and they have a real impact. We have both heard before our committee testimony from EPA administrators who say yes it will increase the price of gasoline to stop and take a look before we leap, to make sure that we are analyzing to understand the impact they will have on our constituents who continue to suffer. The best way to improve our economy is to make sure that we are unleashing every sector of our economy. And yes, that means renewable energy. This bill includes renewable energy. It takes a four-year look at renewable energy on public lands to take advantage of our opportunity with solar on federal lands, with wind on federal lands. But we will not sit idly by while our constituents pay thousands of dollars a year, more each year, to put fuel in the tank, competing with the food on their table. And so, Mr. Speaker, this bill presents us all with a great chance to increase our energy supply, create American jobs, 
and make sure that we understand the full ramifications of regulations, drawdowns of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve before we act. And I think it's important that we say one strong, send one strong message to our constituents that we've heard you. We've heard you loud and clear. And we are going to do everything we can to improve our economy, bring down the cost of energy, create jobs. That's when this Congress will do our job. Our Congress will do our job when we pass this legislation. I urge passage of H.R. 4480. And with that, Mr. Speaker, thank you for your time tonight, and I yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington controls 30 minutes, and he's recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the legislation that we are debating and considering today is a clear all-of-the-above plan to increase American energy production, to lower gasoline prices, and to reduce our dependence on unstable foreign energy. But more than anything else, Mr. Chairman, this is a bill about creating jobs. The Domestic Energy and Jobs Act creates good-paying permanent jobs that will put people back to work and to help grow our economy. The only thing that the Obama administration has been more hostile to than American job creation, Mr. Chairman, is American energy production. But frankly, that shouldn't surprise anyone because the two do go hand in hand. President Obama talks, likes to talk about an all-of-the-above energy plan, but in reality, it's a nothing-from-America energy plan. This administration has, current, has consistently said no to new American energy production while happily forcing hard-working American taxpayers to spend over $1 million a minute on foreign energy. President Obama doesn't want to drill for oil in Utah. Perhaps he'd rather get it from Venezuela. President Obama doesn't want to drill for natural gas in New Mexico. Perhaps he'd rather get it from Yemen. President Obama doesn't want to develop our oil shale in Colorado. Perhaps he'd rather get oil from OPEC. President Obama doesn't want to import oil from our friends in Canada by approving the Keystone Pipelines, perhaps he'd rather import oil from our uh, countries that aren't our friends in the Middle East. And finally, President Obama doesn't want to drill off American coasts, but he doesn't seem to mind Fidel Castro drilling 60 miles from America. And he doesn't seem to mind giving Brazil millions, billions of dollars to help them drill off their coasts and then promise to be their best customer. The American people need to understand that this administration has taken this country in exactly the wrong direction when it comes to developing our vast energy resources. While President Obama has been digging the, American, the, digging the United States into fe, uh, massive fiscal deficits, he has also gotten energy, America into an energy deficit on federal lands from which it could take years to recover. Energy production on federal lands is one of our best opportunities for job creation and energy security. But time and again, that production has been blocked or delayed by this administration. Under this administration, from 2010 and 2011, oil production on federal lands fell by 14 percent, and natural gas production on these same lands fell by 11 percent. Now, Mr. Chairman, this is in stark contrast to oil and natural gas production on state and private lands because that production has boomed. American energy equals American jobs. It's a simple formula for job creation and economic growth, 
but clearly it's one that this administration doesn't seem to understand. Maybe that's because they just don't know how desperate Americans are for jobs. Just a few weeks ago, with unemployment above 8 percent and 23 million Americans work, looking for work, our president told American people that the private sector is doing, quote, just fine, end quote. Well, if you don't know how the problem is, how can you possibly know how to fix it? So, Mr. Chairman, in summary, this is the same president that has issued the lowest number of onshore energy leases, leases since 1984. This is the same president who talks about an all of the above energy plan, but actively blocks the ability to produce more oil and natural gas and coal, and specifically do, doing so on public lands. For President Obama, the all of the above uh, is just a political convenient slogan, but for House Republicans, it's a real job creating energy policy. So I urge my colleagues to vote for the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act to put Americans back to work and get, make us less dependent on foreign sources. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Massachusetts controls 30 minutes and is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield myself as much time as Gentlemen I need. Gentleman is recognized. Okay, thank you. My colleagues, the short title of this bill, the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act, spells out the word D-E-J-A, deja. But what we're seeing here is not just deja vu, the feeling that we're seeing all these big oil giveaways before. No, this bill is a deja preview. A look ahead into what the Romney administration would do if elected and had a GOP House and Senate to fully implement the oil company's legislative agenda and block all efforts to help clean energy. There has been a lot of discussion of the DREAM Act recently, but the bill we have before us today is really the Big Oil DREAM Act. This package represents everything big oil, could ever possibly dream up to drill on our public lands and roll back public health protections. As the world gathers in Rio de Janeiro right now to try to head off catastrophic global warming from the burning of fossil fuels, here we are in the House of Representatives looking for ways to give more benefits to fossil fuel industries. And as America's wind and solar companies look to hire more American workers, here we are in the GOP-controlled House where the Republican leadership refused to make my amendment in order to establish national goals for wind and solar, clean energy, energy efficiency. They won't even allow that debate to take place on the floor of the House of Representatives during what they say is the big energy debate for America. Can you imagine it's 2012, we're having a big energy debate, the big debate on energy future of our country, and the words wind and solar are not going to be permitted by the Republicans to be out here on the House floor and being debated. And by the way, did I throw in biomass? Did I throw in geothermal? Did I throw in energy efficiency? They won't allow the words to be spoken. There's a gag order here, a big gag order by the Republicans. No debating that. And then they have the temerity to call it an all-of-the-above bill. Oh, a comprehensive energy plan without wind, without solar, without geothermal, without biomass, without uh, plug-in hybrids or, or energy efficiency. Debated out here because they have a gag order. They prohibit any debating of those issues on the House floor. And yet, here they are, saying it's an all-of-the-above energy bill. Great, great, so fair, fair and square. A real debate. Let all the members decide what our energy future looks like. But before the end of this year, the Republicans are allowing all the tax break for the wind industry to expire. And what are they doing? They are actually going to continue the $4 billion a year that ExxonMobil and Chevron get. That's fair, huh? A gag order on even mentioning wind and solar out here as part of a, an amendment, a debate. 
Four billion dollars for the oil industry. And by the way, let's take a look at what's going on in oil production in the United States. Oh, did, did you hear the news? It's now at an 18-year high. Obama, drill, baby, drill, Obama. What a great job. An 18-year high under Barack Obama. Way better than George Bush. Way better. You know, all, you got to go back to, you know, almost a time that a kid who's graduating from high school has no memory of. It's 18 years ago. The last time there was this much oil drilling in the United States. Federal, state, private lands. But you listen to the Republicans, they're saying, not enough brakes for ExxonMobil. No, 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 no. We got to give them more. This poor, beleaguered company and all of the other oil companies of the same size, they have been beleaguered as they now are at an 18-year peak in oil production in the United States. And you know who's beating them up? Wind and solar, geothermal, biomass, plug-in hybrids. Very scary things to the Republicans. So scary that because they control the speakership, because they control the Rules Committee, we're not allowed to debate wind and solar. They're prohibiting it today. An absolute all-out prohibition this week on the discussion of wind and solar. Huh? When I asked to have an amendment be put in place that we could debate whether or not we had a national renewable electricity standard for the whole country, setting goals for what our country should have in wind and solar by the year 2020, you know what they said? No, we're gagging you. You can't have that debate out on the House floor. You can't even raise the words wind and solar. And yet they're going to keep coming out here saying they're for all of the above. All of the above that Exxon and Shell and BP want. Right on their list. And you know where wind and solar are on the BP and Exxon Mobil list? Oh, they just forgot to put it on their list. Okay? And that's what we get to debate out here. And it's going to be called an all of the above energy future. Well, let me tell you something. The American people deserve a lot better. They really do have a real sense that America has to be the leader in these new energy technologies. And President Obama has done his best, or else we would not be at an 18-year high. By the way, there are more oil rigs drilling in the United States for oil today, are you ready for this? Than all of the other countries in the world combined. Barack Obama, drill, baby, drill. You are really doing the job. More oil rigs here in the United States right now drilling than all the rest of the world combined. But you're going to listen to these Republicans talk as though somehow or other, although ExxonMobil and BP... And Shell are reporting the largest profits of any corporations in the history of the world that they are being discriminated against. And what does ExxonMobil and BP expect? They expect to be a gag, be applied out here on the floor so we cannot debate wind and solar. We cannot debate biomass and geothermal. We cannot debate energy efficiency. And that we're supposed to sit over here in silence and listen to them say that they have an all-of-the-above energy strategy when we all know their entire strategy is oil above all. Matter of fact, to exclude all else. Exclude it. Can't even debate it. They actually passed the rule here last night prohibiting us from, from debating wind and solar, from debating the future, from unleashing this technological revolution. And why is that the case? I'll tell you why it's the case. Because in the last five years, there has been 45,000 new megawatts of wind installed here in the United States. In this year, there will be 4,000 new megawatts of solar installed in the United States. Do you know who hates that? ExxonMobil hates that. Shell, BP, they hate it. Peabody Coal. Arch coal, they hate it. They see this new clean energy future unfolding. And out here on the floor of the House, as we debate the big energy bill here of 2012, I'm prohibited. I am prohibited 
as the senior Democrat from bringing out an amendment that talks about wind and solar, that talks about geothermal and biomass, that talks about energy efficiency. I'm not allowed to bring it out here. So this is not an auspicious day for the United States Congress. And if there was any kernel of truth about Obama and his incredible work here, lifting us to an 18-year high in total oil production in the United States. By the way, since Bush left, since he left, we have dropped from being 57% dependent upon imported oil down to 45% dependent upon imported oil. Did Bush do that? No. Did Bush's father do that? No. Barack Obama did that, ladies and gentlemen. And what Barack Obama is saying, in addition to the dramatic decline in the amount of oil that we import from the Middle East, I would also like to add wind and solar and geothermal and biomass and energy efficiency. And they're saying, oh no, it's already going too fast. This dependence thing is already happening much too fast for us. And by the way, this revolution in wind and solar, geothermal, people might start driving cars that are all electric and dependent upon wind and solar to give them the electricity. So they don't even have to go into a gas station. You know what they're really afraid of? They're afraid that what is going to happen to them is what happened to the typewriter. That in 20 years, we went from everyone using a typewriter to everyone using a computer. People have to look into a history book to now find what a typewriter looks like. It only took 20 years. And they can see this wind and solar revolution happening so fast that they're afraid that in 2030, a kid won't even know how to fill up a car with gasoline because they'll be plugging in the car at home with solar and wind generated electricity. That's what they're most afraid of. And that's what this debate is really all about. And that's why there's a gag on the Democrats, why we're not allowed to talk about wind and solar and geothermal and biomass and energy efficiency. Oh, I'm sorry, we're allowed to talk about it. We're just not allowed to have an amendment out here on the floor. We're just not allowed to put everyone on record as to where they stand on those issues. We're just not allowed to do that. You cannot have an amendment out here on the floor. So this is the full extent of our ability to help those industries, those competitive industries, those Microsoft and Googles and Ebays and Hulus and YouTubes of the energy industry get out there and reinvent the way in which we generate electricity here in our country. That's what this debate is really all about. And at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. How much time for Doug? Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm very pleased to yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, uh, Mr. Lamborn, author of one of the provisions of this bill. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act. This energy package will unlock some of the vast resources this country has been blessed with, create stable jobs to put Americans back to work, and ensure America's energy security for the future. While President Obama believes that the private sector is doing fine, with an unemployment rate of over 8 percent and 23 million Americans looking for work, more Americans on food stamps than ever before, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us far too many Americans are not doing fine. And while private sector oil and gas are booming, our federal lands are left behind. Rather than encouraging and implementing policies that will create jobs for Americans, the Democrats and the Obama administration unfortunately support anti-energy, job-destroying policies and have refused to act on or have reversed policies that would have created jobs for Americans and allowed for the development of American-made energy. The Strategic Energy Production Act of 2012 takes the steps necessary to increase production of American-made energy and create stable jobs for Americans. The plan lease permit provisions from the Natural Resources Committee in this legislation requires the administration to create a definitive all of the above four-year production plan to ensure American production of conventional and, yes, renewable energy to meet our energy needs. While the administration has been unwilling to make land available for energy production, 
This legislation requires that they annually lease land for onshore development to ensure that the energy production process moves forward. It also streamlines the permitting process to ensure the expeditious and timely permitting of approvals. The legislation also ensures that understaffed and underfunded BLM field offices receive the funding they need to keep up with their workloads. In addition to these reforms, this legislation opens one of our most promising areas for energy production, the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, which would expand American energy production and support current energy jobs for Alaska. Finally, this legislation brings oil and natural gas leasing into the 21st century by allowing the BLM the authority to conduct internet lease sales. This legislation will take huge strides in securing our energies, nation's energy future. It will lessen our dependence on foreign sources of oil and create good paying jobs for Americans across the country. Gotcha. Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts. I yield uh, four minutes to the gentleman from New York State, uh, Mr. Tomko. The gentleman from New York is recognized for four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise in opposition uh, to H.R. 4480, which I heard my good friend and colleague from Massachusetts, uh, Representative Markey, refer to as the Deja Preview Act or the Big Oil Dream Act. Uh, any student of history will tell you that the Congress was not designed to be efficient. Well, there were some good reasons for that, but deliberately celebrating that particular design of Congress with yet another partisan, short-sighted piece of legislation that moves United States energy policy backward is truly disappointing. H.R. 4480 leaves our energy policy stuck somewhere in the 1950s. While other nations are making serious investments to diversify their energy supplies, support new clean energy businesses, and become less dependent on traditional fossil fuels, we are marching in place. H.R. 4480, with its gag order on renewables and energy efficiency, is another missed opportunity and a waste of time. H.R. 4480 is nothing more than a wish list for big oil companies at a time when these companies are making record profits on the backs of America's taxpayers and her middle class. Our energy crisis isn't that we need to drill for more oil. In fact, we're actually quite good at it, as we saw in Representative Markey's presentation. This bill will only make us more dependent on a limited resource that is priced on the global market and enjoys a century-old taxpayer giveaway while making record profits on the backs of our middle class. The answer to our energy crisis is to diversify our supply, support new clean energy businesses, become less dependent on fossil fuels, to focus on the demand side of the energy equation as much as we do our supply side. While we consider this bill, policies that would provide modest assistance to companies that are working on solar, wind, fuel cells, combined heat and power, geothermal and energy efficiency, to name a few, are languishing in committee. These are the technologies that will take us into the future, a bold future. True, they are not yet ready to provide all the energy we need, but that is all the more reason for us to help them move forward aggressively. Jobs in the industries I've mentioned, good-paying jobs are at risk due to our failure to renew the production tax credit the 1603 program, and the research and development tax credit. We are stifling job growth and innovation with this act. Eventually, traditional fossil fuels will run out. Already, the human health and environmental costs of extracting and using these fuels have risen tremendously. We choose to ignore this at our peril, or at least at the peril, of the next generation and generations to come. Over the past 40 years, the Clean Air Act has shown we can have both clean air and a vibrant economy. Since 1970, air pollution has decreased by more than 70 percent, while the economy had grown by more than 200 percent. But this bill is likely to eliminate jobs while making the air we breathe more toxic. But that doesn't seem to matter 
to the majority in the House. It does so by eliminating standards for cleaner vehicles and cleaner fuels, likely costing nearly 25,000 jobs a year for three years. Yet more backward motion. The public lands policy put forward today and in yesterday's legislation is an insult to the previous generations whose foresight and concern for future generations granted us a rich inheritance of natural resources in our wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and national parks. H.R. 4480 drastically alters. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield. Uh